Today, essentially, we want to look at the chapter one material, which is the introduction to separations. So the key things we're going to be looking at today is actually looking at the role of, of separation operations in the chemical industries. Okay? And also, how we can look at the five sort of basic separation techniques or f the five classifications that we can put all separation techniques into. We'll also think how we can actually think about selecting different separations for our processes. So we'll see, look at processes and think how, what separation is actually the best separation to use and the factors we want to think about. And also, then we're just going to be looking at how we can actually specify how good our separation is. Okay, so how do we know if we've picked a good separation? Okay. So separations have essentially been around forever. Okay. One of the first actual processes that have been put in. So, for instance, we're thinking of things like extracting metal from metal ores. So, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, all came about because of the ability to extract those metal from those ores. But they're separation processes. And they're separation processes that are actually still used today. Okay? Then we've got Things like extracting perfumes from flowers and dyes from plants, been around for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, ancient Egyptians used dyes from plants in the pyramids. Yep, the process is still pretty much the same today. Evaporation of seawater to obtain salt, although may be thought of as a as a newer operation, has been going on for many, many years. The Romans would extract salt from seawater. And then, of course, distilling liquor. Okay, so alcohol enrichment, alcohol enhancement. Again, the processes are very similar today as were used for thousands of years. So although some of these techniques have been embedded for many years, obviously in industry, we need to still think about how we can optimize these. But also, there's new techniques as well that we can also bring in to our armory when we're thinking of different separation techniques to use. So the key driver for me for this course is that basically in plants, in chemical plants, typically between 40 to 70 percent of the total plant cost and the total operating cost is due to the separations. Okay? So if we can optimize the separations or if we can pick a better separation to use and save money, it's going to be a clear win for our plants. Okay? And then if you also have this coupled with techniques like process integration, heat recovery, energy recovery as well, it allows you to have more tools to optimize your plants, to save money and save energy. So you can see if this is our sort of standard, very basic plant, and you can see that it's dominated by our separation. So we may end up with a feed that's impure, and we may have to purify and separate that feed before we can even put it into the reactor. Our reactor then is very likely not to be 100% efficient. So we've got to do some separating to actually get some of our unreacted feed back into our reactor so we can use that and save our unreacted feed so it's not wasted. And also, our reactor may not be making just one product. It might be making a byproduct, or we might be making multiple products at the same time. So we need further separations to actually purify our product. Okay? And each of those separations will have different constraints on it as we're actually moving through our plant. 
The other key thing with separations is that because of this major cost in the process plants, often the difficulty of the separation and the original purity of the product actually defines the cost of our product because we're sp spending all that money on the separations. So, for example, if we look down here at certain metals, uh, you've got penicillin, uh, that nickel, copper, zinc down here. All of those in their sort of naturally found forms are relatively high concentrations. So although we have to do a separation to get it as a pure component, the actual cost of that is not very high. But then when we move up to some other products, so we've got insulin here and uh, urokinase up here, which are all used in more bio activities, medicines, then the natural concentration of these materials is very, very low. And it's because of all the separation that's actually needed to actually purify those products. That, that is why the cost of these types of products is so high. So not only can we save money in our processes by actually having a cheaper separation, we can also make the pro we can also actually make the component cheaper based on new separation techniques or better separation technologies. You know, could you imagine if you could produce insulin using a new separation technique that reduced the cost? You could then reduce the cost of the insulin, right? And then for humans, that's a great, uh, that's a great sort of societal impact and it still just comes from us thinking about different types of separations or optimizing separations in our chemical process. Okay? So, mixing of chemicals, which I'm sure you've all looked at in other courses, even if it's not active, just combining gases together, and thinking about that, is relatively spontaneous. Okay? I'll include the word relative as someone who researches in the mixing area. It's relatively spontaneous because we're increasing the entropy because we're increasing the randomness in our systems. And that's good and that's easy for us to do. Separation is essentially the opposite of this. So with separations, we've got to put in some kind of energy into our system to actually allow us to take that separation. So separations can generally be divided into two categories. There's a homogeneous separation where all our components are one continuous system. So these are much more difficult separations, tend to be much more diff difficult separations to achieve or heterogeneous separations where we've got components in different phases. And the advantage of that is if we've got these different phases and they're immiscible phases, then we can do a mechanical separation to actually separate those phases. And that's the preferred type of separation. And by mechanical separation, I'm talking about putting work in. So for instance, the use of gravity is a, is a work separation or a separation where we're putting mechanical work in. Okay? And sometimes in our separations as we're going through, we actually put other energy into our system so we can actually create a heterogeneous system because it's, then, it's still more efficient to actually have that heterogeneous system. So for example, distillation of two liquids, we actually add energy to actually vaporize some of our liquids. We're creating that second phase because then it's much easier to separate the vapor from the liquid. Okay? So apart from this homogeneous and heterogeneous for the systems we're separating, there's two ways that we can actually think about classifying separation. 
So the first one is actually around the property. So that's the property we're actually using to separate our components from each other. Okay. And this is really useful because if we can think about separations and what properties they're separating, then when we've got our particular system, we can actually look at the properties of the components in our system, see which ones have differences, and then take advantage of those differences. Okay? So we've got both molecular properties and we've also got thermodynamic and transport properties. So molecular properties, we're, think, we're looking at things like weight, the size of the molecules, things like dipole moments. So that's looking at separations like membrane separations, uh, filtration, where we're doing a cut based on the size. Then things like dipole moment, uh, electric charge, dielectric constant, things like ion exchange, and separations like this. Okay? So we're looking at our different properties and then we're finding which are different and then we find a separation <coughs> that actually can separate them. Okay? So I'm not going to go through obviously all the you know, low, tens, twenties, hundreds of different separation techniques that are possible. In your handbook, you've got a big list of several different types of separations. Okay? And in that list, it gives you some examples of what they're used for, but more importantly, it also tells you what particular property that separation is exploiting. Okay? Well, as well as molecular properties, as I say, we've got thermodynamic and transport properties, so we're looking at taking advantage of things like vapor pressure, which you should hopefully recognize as distillation. It's one of the key techniques that takes advantage of vapor pressure. Solubility would be something like liquid-liquid extraction, which we'll be looking at in, later in this course, um, or crystallization, potentially. Uh, adsorptivity and diffusivity could be techniques like adsorption, absorption, things like that, that, some of which you've looked at and some of which you'll look at next year, or if you're the MSc students, potentially this semester as well for absorption. Okay? So the key thing is really to think about those properties and then link those properties to those particular separations that we can use. The other method about for classifying separations is actually the method of separation. Okay? So there's actually five key methods of separation. You've got what's called phase creation, phase addition, barrier, solid agent, and force field or gradient. Okay, so that's the five key mechanisms or methods of separation processes. So all separations can be classified under one of those five methods. Okay? So the first one of these is phase creation. So as I was saying before, when we're thinking about a heterogeneous system, so that actually they're much easier to separate. So phase creation is all about creating that second heterogeneous phase. So we're adding something, generally energy, to create a second phase that is immiscible with our feed. Okay? And we can do that by adding energy or changing the pressure, potentially pressure reduction, um, <clears throat> and pressure increase. Uh, so, for instance, it's really useful if we've got materials that can vaporize. So, things like evaporation, sublimation, distillation. So, if we've got a liquid <clears throat> and we want to separate the components in our liquid, as I said, if you've got distillation, we can take advantage of a difference in vapor pressure. So therefore, we want to boil one of our components. And we can do that by either adding energy in terms of heat to our system, so increasing the temperature and letting something vaporize. Or we could reduce the pressure on our system, which would also vaporize part of our system. Okay. Okay. 
So as well as phase creation, we can also have phase addition. In this case, we're adding something, we're adding a new component to our system. So instead of adding energy, or uh, instead of adding heat energy or pressure or something like that to our system, we're actually adding a second phase. And that second phase really needs to be immiscible with our feed phase. Okay? <clears throat> And one of the key examples of this one that we'll be looking at in this course is liquid-liquid extraction. So next week, you'll start to study one of the key phase addition separations. So we don't just have to add, we're not just restricted to adding a second phase, which we tend to call a mass separating agent, or an MSA. We can still, if needed, add energy to our system, or an energy separating agent, so an ESA, okay? So there's some key disadvantages, as I'm sure you can imagine, from actually adding another component to our system. So we've already got a mixture of components which we need to separate. But in order to separate those, say, two components, we're now adding a third component into that system. So although that helps us separating our original two components, we now actually have three components in our system that we need to separate. Okay? But it may be the only viable solution to actually do that separation. So what we end up generally having to do is add an additional separator to actually recover our mass separating agent. And although we're recovering our mass separating agent, you know, no, no separation is 100% perfect, so we will end up losing some. So we'll need to put in a makeup stream for that mass separating agent, so it's not a perfect recycle process. Because we've added another component to our system, we may end up adding something that can add some con contamination to our product. Okay, so we need to think about that. And also, it's a more difficult to design procedure in, it, in nothing else as the fact that originally if we had two components, we likely need one separator to do that. But now, because we've got three components, we need two separators to separate that. So even if it's not necessarily more difficult, it's at least more work. Okay? And the other thing that we have to think about is if we're adding another phase to our system, <clears throat> because the whole point of adding a mass separa separating agent is that it forms an immiscible phase, we have to think about mixing those phases together to start with to actually allow our separation process of the original feed to occur. Okay? And then, so we need to think about our mass transfer rates in that system, and then after we've done that, we can let them re-separate back to our immiscible phases. And you'll see more of that with liquid-liquid extraction next week. <clears throat> So our third option is separation by barrier. <clears throat> so in this case, we're not adding any material to our system, but we do have some kind of barrier. So it might be a, a membrane or a filter or something like that in our system. <coughs> and the way that works is essentially part of our feed passes through the barrier and part of our feed either doesn't pass through the barrier or passes through our barrier at a much slower rate, therefore is more likely to come in and not go through the barrier than it is to go through our barrier. <clears throat> These can either be porous or non-porous systems, depending on the size of our separations. So, for instance, if we're doing filtration, we would have a porous filter that allows water to pass through. But if we're doing some gas 
separations. We would have a non-porous membrane where the gases actually adsorb onto our barrier surface and have to actually diffuse actively through our barrier. I've focused on membranes here because they're really now the dominant form of this separation by barrier technique. And the mem membranes can be basically made from a wide variety of materials. So polymers, natural fibers, ceramics, metals, things like that. Okay? And <clears throat> the material used is, is dependent on the application. And I say without porous membranes, we're separating based on essentially having a different diffusion rate through our membrane or a different physical size so one won't pass through our membrane. And with our non-porous, we're actually separating based on the solubility of our material to adsorb onto that membrane. Okay? Our fourth option is separating by a solid agent. So it's a process that essentially uses a mass separating agent, but, but specifically that mass separating agent is a solid. Okay? And one of the advantages of that is that we can have some kind of granular or packed material which we can actually have to collect one of our phases in our system. So we're, although we're adding an extra phase, normally because it's a solid, it's contained within our separator, so then we don't need to worry about separating that solid necessarily afterwards. So here we've got some examples that are used more in uh, adsorption, so things like activated carbon, lumen oxide, silica gel, or zeolite structures. Okay, so these will preferentially absorb one of our components onto the solid material, and then heating up the solid material or changing the pressure of the environment will then release the one that has actually been absorbed onto that solid material to regenerate our solid material to be used again. Okay. And I say this is one of the key things that you'll see in the adsorption <coughs> module. <coughs> and our final one <coughs> is separation by force field or gradient. Okay. So we can have an external field on our system that can take advantages of different responses in our system. So those of you that did solid processing last year, should be very familiar with some of these techniques because one of the key force fields that we use is gravity, so anything to do with settling is a separation by force field, okay? And we can actually tend to add this technique to enhance other separation techniques, okay? So, for example, the, the one up from settling or sedimentation is to put it into a centrifuge. Okay, so we're adding an extra force to our system to enhance a separation. Okay, some of you may have started to see things like uh, when we come on to liquid-liquid uh, extraction, you can have your liquid extraction, but you can then have a column with moving parts inside, which essentially adds a centri centrifugal force during part of that separation process to enhance the actual mass separation in that process. Okay? So <clears throat> this, this technique can either be used by itself or can be added to some of the others to enhance the rate of separation. So one of the, <clears throat> the key things we need to do, so we, we're armed with our list of different separation techniques. As I said, there's a load listed in your handbook. So we're armed with that list of separation techniques. 
But how are we going to actually select what separation we want to use? Okay? So our everything we need to consider is locked in our process. So some of the properties of our process will have the ability to affect and some will just be fixed. Okay, so we have to work out what are fixed and what we can actually change or use to our advantage in our separation. <clears throat> so for example, feed conditions is one of the key things we need to think about. So what is actually coming into our separator that we need to separate. Okay? So some of those parameters for our feed conditions are set. So composition, what our feed is, is set. We can't do anything about that. We can't change that for our separation because it's our job designing the separation to actually do that bit. Okay? So we're fixed on the composition. We're also generally fixed on the flow rate. Yep. So the flow rate of our feed will be defined by our process how much we want to make, how much the previous part of our process is giving to us. Okay? So there's very little we can do about that. Other feed conditions we have might be the phase. Okay? So, yes, we can do something about the phase of some feeds. So if we have a liquid, we could potentially think about vaporizing it to take advantage of a vapor separation rather than a liquid separation. We could think about freezing it to turn it into a solid. Okay? So we do have that flexibility. However, phase change is very expensive. Okay? So it's something we don't want to do as our first port of call. We would ideally want to think about a separation that uses the current phase of the, the stream that we already have of our feed stream. Okay? Very similar <clears throat> is our product conditions. Okay? So yes, we may be able to manipulate the phase, the temperature, the pressure of our products, but that's very expensive. <coughs> but the composition of our products and the flow rate of our products are generally fixed. Yep. So if you're separating to go into a reactor, you may need a specific purity of your product to allow your reactor to work. If your separator is right at the end of your process, you may need a purity of product to even be able to sell that product. So if you don't meet that purity, your, that product is a waste. Okay? So your separation has to get it to that purity to be able to sell it. That's fixed. We're not in control of that. Okay? And again, just like the feed conditions, as I said, you, may, you can think about changing the phase, the temperature, the pressure, but it's expensive. So if you can have a separation that naturally works in the phase you want your product to be in, that is going to be a cheaper option for you. Okay? So our third one is property differences. Okay? So these are inherent to our system. Okay? So just if you've got two materials mixed together, you can't just change the density of those two components. That's a fixed, that's a fixed uh, property. Okay? So the difference in properties are fixed. However, there are some that you can change slightly. Okay? So for instance, vapor pressure. Okay? So the difference between two components in terms of vapor pressure is the relative volatility. Yep. And you've probably already seen from thermodynamics, from distillation and absorption, that if you change the pressure of the system, then that relative volatility can change slightly. Yep. So you do have the opportunity to make some small changes to certain properties. But again, because we're changing pressure, we're potentially changing temperature or phase, it's expensive. Yep. So if we can find a separation 
that will work based on the difference in properties of the materials you have at the temperature, at the pressure, at the phase you have, it's likely to be a cheaper separation to use. So characteristics of the operation or the separation is another key one. Okay? So we've mentioned a couple of separation techniques in passing, so distillation. With distillation, depending on the way you set your system, because you've got degrees of freedom like the reflux ratio, the number of stages, what you can do is you can actually specify the composition of both your exit streams. Okay? But if you've got something like a membrane, because a membrane is only dependent on the rate of diffusion through that membrane, and that rate of diffusion is an inherent property to the system, and there's only that one degree of freedom, you can't actually specify the output of both of your exit streams. Yep. So with membranes, you can either have something like a low flow rate, high pure product, or a high flow rate, low pure product. You can't have both. Whereas with distillation, you can increase the flow rate and you can increase the purity by changing things like the reflux ratio. Okay? So with membranes, you've got that inherent property system that doesn't allow you to always get the specification you want. And later today, we'll see how we can actually specify those specifications and the, the purity of our products. So economics. So all separations have a cost, which we've been talking about. Certain separations are just cheaper than other separations. Okay? So things like membranes, certain membrane materials are very expensive. You may have to replace those membranes very often. So it's likely to be more expensive than a distillation column. Okay? But your operating costs may be more expensive to run a distillation column. Okay? So we'll see in this course, we'll see some more examples around that specifically for distillation, when we're thinking about distillation sequencing. Okay. <clears throat> and the final one on the list is opinion. Okay. So at the end of the day, even though you're the process engineer, you might be designing the separation, it's unlikely that you're going to be signing off on the new process. Okay. So you can go in and say, I found this great separation technique, it's amazing, it does exactly what we want to do, it's super cheap, it's better than anything we're currently doing. However, it's never been tried in our industry before. Okay? Now, is your boss, say you're in oil and gas, is your boss going to say, do you know what? It's only going to cost us a billion pound a day in profit for every day your separation doesn't work. So do you know what? We'll risk that or we'll pay slightly more and get a distillation column in. Right? So there's the opinion of the people. There's tried and tested techniques that we've always used based on new separations that we can think about but have to be tested and proved. And in certain industries, they're used a lot more. So I'll stick with membranes as an example, because in certain industries, membranes are one of the go-to separations. Uh, water purification, membranes are what the go-to separation for that. Oil and gas, not so much. Distillation columns. Yep, there's no reason that membranes wouldn't necessarily work in that system. They may be cheaper, but because we're of the opinion and the history and how much they've been used and the experience in those industries, that also drives what separation we're actually going to be using, what technology we're going to be using in our systems, in our processes. <clears throat>
So when we're thinking about separations, it's very rare that we just have two, two components that we want to separate. We'll generally have a lot of systems together, so thinking something like crude oil, maybe hundreds of components. Yep, but we may want eight or nine products from that. Uh, other processes may have a lot of waste products in that we need to remove. So when we're thinking about our separations, then there's some rules of thumb to allow us to actually pick the best sequence of separations. And we'll do a lot more of this when we think about distillation sequencing. But sequencing doesn't just have to be distillation, even though that is one of the common areas we think about it. So the standard rules of thumb are the component that the most plentiful, so the most plentiful impurities, get rid of them first because they'll reduce your overall flow rate the most. And if you've got a lower overall flow rate, your follow-on separations can be smaller and will automatically be cheaper. Okay? Remove the easiest to remove impurities first. Okay? So if they're easiest to remove, your separation doesn't have to be as difficult. And at the start, you've got the most flow rate. So you want to do the separations as the cheapest and easiest to do while you've got large flow rates. And then, of course, following on, the most difficult and expensive separations last, because that's where you've got the lowest flow rates. So your most difficult, most expensive separation to do you want to do that to minimize the cost as much as possible by doing it where you've got the lowest flow rate in your system, which is the end. There's no point in doing that first, your most expensive thing first, and under the conditions that make it even more expensive. Yep. Select processes that make use of the greatest differences in the properties of the products and its impurities. So that's what I was saying. So make use of the different properties. So each component you have has a whole range of properties. And traditionally, people do think of a few key properties. Say vapor pressure, the distillation is one of the key ones. But there could be other property differences that we could take advantage of that actually make a cheaper separation and an easier separation for us to do. And then it actually tends to be cheaper to actually have different types of separators in our system, taking advantage of our greatest differences at each point within our system. Okay? So when you're thinking about separations, don't limit yourself to a few. Actually do think broad first, and then think about the factors we just talked about to narrow it down to what might be the optimum separation technique. So here's just a quick thought. So hopefully very simply, so if we've got just a, mix, a mixture of 10% ethanol in water, so basically, what's that, weak alcohol, a strong beer, something like that, and we want to produce 50% ethanol in water, so a relatively strong vodka. What separation can we do to do that? Did I hear something over this side? Yeah? Evaporation, distillation, yeah. So we're taking advantage of the fact that we've got a different relative volatility between the ethanol and our water system, okay? So, let's change that up slightly. So, exactly the same feedstock, okay? So, we've got exactly the same going in, but what if we wanted to produce 99 volume percent ethanol in water, so basically medical grade alcohol? Can we still use distillation? No. Why not? <coughs> Pardon? Azeotrope, yeah. So, there's a, so this system happens to have an azeotrope in it. And that is something that you can't get past with a, sing, a single simple distillation column. Okay? So although 
we've still got exactly the same feed. It's actually our product composition that has limited us in this case. Okay? So we actually need to think about our whole system and what we're making when we're looking at our separation. Okay? So, in fact, there are several ways to separate this and it will actually, go, will actually come up through the course, different ways to separate water and ethanol. Um, and you can use techniques that will come across in the azeotropic distillation section. Um, you could look at freezing. If anyone's ever put very cheap vodka into a freezer, you'll notice that you can freeze some of the water away from that. Okay, so there are different methods that we can think about to take advantage of different properties between our systems. But although we've got those properties, we also have to think how they may change during our separation. Because in this case, although at our feed condition, we have a difference in relative volatility, at a point partway through our process, our relative volatility goes to 1, which means we can't use distillation anymore. Okay? So I just wanted to, to quickly finish off the slides for today before the final part of the tutorials and an example question. Um, so we've talked about sequencing separations. We've got some ideas about what separations we can possibly use. You've been doing a question there thinking about potential separations. So say you've got some example separations in the handbook to look at in more detail. But how can we actually see if the separation is any good? Okay? So you should hopefully not have forgot how to do component balances, but basically the key thing for us is whatever we put in to our system in our feed has to come out in one of our product streams. Okay? So when we're looking at separations, because we can actually have multiple components, so more than two components in our system, but Really, we can only design our separation based around actually separating two of those components. Okay? So what we do is we define the two that we actually want to carry out the separation between as our key components. Okay? So in this case, we've got five components here, A, B, C, D, and E. But well, actually, we want to separate B from C. So B would be one of our key components, and C would be our other key component. And then in distillation specifically, not only do we just have a term key components, they also define what's called the light key component and the heavy key component. So the light key component has the highest relative volatility, hence our lowest boiling point, and our heavy key has a low relative volatility and hence our highest boiling point. So in this case, for this separation, if it was distillation, we define B as a key component but our light key component, and that would be the component that we're specifying in our top product, and C would be our heavy key component and, of course, that would be the component that we're specifying in our bottom product. Okay? So one of the key metrics that we can use across processes is what's called the component recovery. So generally, our plants or our processes are designed to meet a particular recovery and also a product purity. So, for instance, we can just specify something like a percent recovery. So, for example, 90% of our component A has to end up in our top product. So, that would be a 90% recovery for that particular process. Okay? Or our product purity, 
for instance, our top product must be 99% A, okay, and then 1% everything else. Okay, so these are two key metrics that we use to actually define what we want in our process. So recovery, 1% we get out as a usable product, and then purity, so how much of our component is in our particular product. So there's a couple of other key metrics that we sometimes use as well. So the difference between these and, say, like a recovery, is we can generally look at a recovery across a whole process. Whereas with these metrics, they're generally separation specific. So for example, we've got our components that are partitioned between our products. And these are partitioned according to the split fraction. Okay? So this is our definition of the split fraction. So you'll see you can have a split fraction for each component. So in this case, component I. But also, you have a split fraction on each particular separator. So in this case, it's a split fraction for our component I, but on our separator K because we may have 10 different separations in our system or more, okay? And it's essentially the amount in our main product divided by the amount of that component in our feed. So, for instance, if we want the split fraction of our A, we would need to know how much A was in our feed and how much is in our product where our A is, okay? The second key metric we've got is split ratio. So again, it's for a particular component and a particular separation. But in this case, it's the ratio between the two products. Okay? So in this case, if we wanted the split ratio of component B, we would have the amount in our main product of B divided by the amount in our essential like byproduct or waste stream that happens to contain a little bit of B. Okay? And if we've got only two product streams, we can actually write the split ratio in terms of our split fraction. Okay? And our third key metric is what's called the separation factor. So I mentioned to you before about something like distillation. It can actually specify a top and a bottom product because we've got the degrees of freedom to change the number of trays and the reflux ratio. But with something like a membrane, we're limited by either the molecular weight or the diffusivity of the material through our membrane. Now, in this case, we may not get a very sharp split in our components. And in that case, what we tend to do is use something called the separation factor, okay? Or the separation power, which is why it's got the symbol FP. What that essentially is, if we've got our two key components, so we've got our product one, and we have the concentration of our component I in product one divided by the composition of that component I in product two, divided by that same ratio but for our second key component. Okay? And that's the separation power. And the values that that can actually take, we can actually change by things like the number of stages, and of course is defined by the actual properties of those components in the separation. Now, if you think about the separation power, because we're defining a component and a, just, and a product, there are multiple ways to actually define which is our main product for which component, okay? But what the important thing is to do in the convention that is done 
is that our components i and j and our products 1 and 2 are selected so that our separation factor is always larger than 1. Okay? That's just by convention. So if you get an answer less than 1, you've likely just done it upside down. Okay? So what does that mean? So if we've got a very large value of our separation factor, that means we've got a very good separation or a high degree of separation. And if we've got a small value very close to 1, it basically is a very poor separation. Or a value of 1 is actually no separation at all. Okay? So if you just have one pipe that splits into two pipes, that will, give you a that will give you a separation factor of 1, because there's no change in composition. There's actually no separation there. So just quickly, and then we'll go through it. Uh, question 3 in your handbooks all will appear up here. So for this system of three distillation columns, what is the split fraction, the split ratio, and the recovery of our C3H8 product uh, in our system. Okay? So just have a quick look at that and then. So the split fraction. So, what's the key thing that I said about the split fraction to start with? So, so for the split fraction, it's dependent on. It was I, the component, and K, the separator. Yeah, so we need, for a split fraction, we need to define both the component and the separator. So we were told that the component we were interested in is the C3 component on there. So therefore, what is the key separator that we're interested in? C2, yeah, I heard some C2s, yeah, so T2, because that's the separator where the actual separation of the C3 component occurs. Yep, so we need our, essentially we need our product over our feed, so we've identified our component C3, we've identified our separator C2, so essentially that's the two streams that we're interested in. Stream 3 as our feed and stream 4 as our product. So we can grab those two numbers out of our table and then we can use that to calculate our split fraction for this system to be 0.96 and a tiny little bit more. Okay? So the key thing there was identifying the separator so we could identify the right streams. So the second part was the split ratio. Okay? So if you remember with the split ratio, we also had that same, that same part. We needed to identify the product and the separator. But the split ratio is between our two products. So P1, our main product, and P2, our byproduct. So in this case, which stream is our P1 stream? Four, yeah? So four is our main product, and then which one is our P2, our sort of byproduct or waste stream from that separator? Heard five, yeah? Five, yeah. So in this case, we've got our P1 stream and our P2 stream. So we've identified those. So again, we can take the numbers from the table and we can work out in this case that our split ratio is just slightly under 25. Okay? So the final one that we were asked for was recovery. Okay? Now, what did I say was different about the recovery? So the recovery is that we were looking over the whole process. Yep. 
So with the split fraction and split ratios, it's on that particular separator. But unless specified as standard, we think about the recovery as a whole process. So how much of our C3 that enters our process comes out. So what, therefore, are our two key streams in this case? One I heard, and, and four, yes, because we're just talking our useful product. So again, we identify our product and our feed, but in this case, our global feed, and therefore we can calculate our recovery, which we typically express as a percentage, so just slightly better than 96% recovery. Yeah. Okay? So we can use these metrics to essentially rate all of our separations. So today, basically, we covered why separations are important to a process, and then how we can actually classify those separations, whether it be by the property we're separating or the generic type of separation. Okay? So we thought about the different materials we can use and how to select those separations. And then we moved on to looking at how we can actually specify the quality of those separations with the split fraction and the split ratio, and also thought about for some operations we have to use the separation power, the separation factor instead to try and characterize those particular separations. Okay? So as I mentioned at the start, next week we'll be moving on to liquid-liquid extraction.